Welcome to Davo Bible Community Church's online worship service. To get the best online worship experience, please be reminded of the following. Prepare your heart and your mind to worship God. Express your adoration and thanksgiving to God by participating in the praise and worship. Pray for wisdom and enlightenment as you listen to the preaching. Take notes, be at a comfortable place, and remove all possible distractions. Use the widest screen possible. Make sure your audio is loud enough to accommodate the other viewers with you. Encourage your family and friends to join the service with you. If you are not living near each other, you can share the service by sending them the link to the service through your newsfeed or through Messenger. If it is the first Sunday of the month, you are encouraged to prepare the holy elements ahead of time for the Holy Communion. We're almost minutes away to our worship proper, but before we start, let me take you through our church's mission and vision. Our mission, to obey the great commission of our Lord Jesus Christ in disciple-making by discipling people, bridging peace initiatives, collaborative partnerships, and church planting. Our vision, DBCC is a disciple-building community where every member is a disciple-builder committed to community transformation that seeks to rescue and release children and families from the cycle of sin and poverty in Jesus' name by the power of the Spirit for the glory of God the Father.
Welcome to Davo Bible Community Church's online worship service. To get the best online worship experience, please be reminded of the following. Prepare your heart and your mind to worship God. Express your adoration and thanksgiving to God by participating in the praise and worship. Pray for wisdom and enlightenment as you listen to the preaching. Take notes, be at a comfortable place, and remove all possible distractions. Use the widest screen possible. Make sure your audio is loud enough to accommodate the other viewers with you. Encourage your family and friends to join the service with you. If you are not living near each other, you can share the service by sending them the link to the service through your newsfeed or through Messenger. If it is the first Sunday of the month, you are encouraged to prepare the holy elements ahead of time for the Holy Communion. We're almost minutes away to our worship proper, but before we start, let me take you through our church's mission and vision. Our mission, to obey the great commission of our Lord Jesus Christ in disciple-making by discipling people, bridging peace initiatives, collaborative partnerships, and church planting. Our vision. DBCC is a disciple-building community where every member is a disciple-builder committed to community transformation that seeks to rescue and release children and families from the cycle of sin and poverty in Jesus' name by the power of the Spirit for the glory of God the Father. Good morning, DBCC. Psalm chapter 29, verses 1 to 2 says, Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. 
Ascribe to the Lord the glory to His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. Indeed, our God is worthy of all our praise, worship, and adoration. And the best way to worship Him is to live a life of obedience, a life that is fully yielded to Him. In John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus says, Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. And obedience to the Lord is the wisest decision one can ever make, as it always brings blessing and sure footing. And the Spirit of God who is in us will enable us to do this. Although we are not perfect and might sometimes fail to obey God's commands, 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So church, as we start our worship proper, let us take the first step to obedience, and that is repentance. Let us ask the Holy Spirit to purify our hearts and our minds and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and give us heart that is fully yielded to God. One more time. Refiner's fly.
us ready to do to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Church, why don't we give God mighty, mighty clap offering. Let's praise Him this morning. Let's lift our voices to our God who is worthy to be praised. Amen. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord, with all our heart, soul, mind, and with all our strength. Let's declare. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Let's say, Love the Lord your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Let's say, With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord your God, with all your heart, with all your soul. Of God this morning. We will serve you, Father. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. Yes, Lord. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. Church, let's declare with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. Serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all your mind, with all my strength. I love the Lord, for He heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because He turned His ear to me, I will call on Him as long as I live. I will sacrifice a thank offering to Him and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all His people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord! Hallelujah! Why don't we lift our voices and declare this truth? And I will love you. Sing it out!
are worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Merciful God, we thank you for your amazing grace, for sacrificing your one and only Son, Jesus, to save us. We thank you, Lord, for the way your grace has filled, shaped, and guided our lives. We thank you for the privilege of living in your grace each day. May we seek to obey you in all that we do, not in order to earn your favor, but so that we might respond appropriately to the favor you've already given to us. As we receive your mercies, which are new every morning, may they motivate us to offer ourselves to you. May our obedience to you be an act of thanksgiving and be a demonstration of our love for you. Why don't we sing this and worship God? My Jesus, I love thee. Cry. 
Thanksgiving and adoration we belong to you, Father, now and always. Amen. We praise you, Father. Brethren, welcome to our online Sunday worship service. Today is the first Sunday of September, and that means Communion Sunday. May I invite you then to prepare your communion meal set, the sanctified bread and the sanctified grape juice. And then later after the sermon, kindly join us in the celebration and commemoration of the Lord's Holy Meal. Today's Sunday sermon also will be special because we will be featuring one of the sermon series given by the Reverend Edmund Chan in the recent holding of the Intentional Disciple Making Conference last Friday and Saturday. And we thank the Lord that our church has been given the privilege to join in this conference and we were so blessed by the messages given and we would like to share one of them with you today the reverend edmund chan is the leadership mentor of the covenant evangelical free church and at the same time the founder of global alliance of Intentional Disciple-Making Conference. Kindly prepare yourselves now in heart and mind to listen to God's servant, the Reverend Edmund Chan, as he shares God's message to us. Over the years, Anne and I have searched the scriptures, gleaned discipleship principles from the Word, and from the fruit of these studies, have faithfully followed the Lord's leading in co-authoring four Discipleship Bible Study series. Grace and Glory culminates a long journey that started in 2004. During my sabbatical in London, in the winter of 2004, Anne and I would engage in a daily Bible study together. After we sent the kids to school, we cleared the breakfast table, brewed a pot of Earl Grey tea, and opened the Scriptures. Leisurely and unrushed, we studied over 50 of my favorite Bible passages pertinent to discipleship. Each morning, Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 12 noon. We got so blessed by it, we led others in the study, and out came roots and wings. The materials were then used in Bible studies and mentoring settings. Field tested over five years since 2004 in different countries, before they were being published. But we didn't stop there. Even before Roots and Wings were published, Anne and I already mapped out more than 220 Bible passages pertinent to discipleship and sowed the seeds of our studies in what we envisage to be four discipleship Bible study series. Roots and Wings, the eight core curriculum for discipleship, Life and Legacy in 2015, mapping out five processes towards spiritual maturity. In 2018, Faith and Fire, exploring five dimensions of the inner life. And finally, the fourth and final installment, Grace and Glory 2021, that highlights five basic building blocks in kingdom living. So welcome to Grace and Glory. Here then are the five foundational building blocks five core values that we will explore in grace and glory. Number one, truth. 
We value truth centered upon the Word of God. There is one truth, one foundation. Two, community. We value community centered upon the worship of God. There is one body, one identity. Three, stewardship. We value stewardship centered upon the will of God. There is one life, one purpose. And four, balance. We value balance centered upon the wisdom of God. There is one compass, one integration. And number five, brokenness. We value brokenness centered upon the way of God. There is one God, one allegiance. Now, why are core values important? The older I get, the more I learn to appreciate the immense significance of core values. One of the defining features of great leadership is clarity. And one of the chief expressions of leadership clarity is the ability to define our distinctives and to determine our core values. Core values are not mission or vision statements, nor are they organizational strategies. Rather, they are curated as a fundamental statement of what is truly important to the organization. Jack Welch, CEO of General Electric, once asked David Novak, what name one of the top people in business by fortune. If you were in my position about to start a new company, what would you do? Novak gave a brilliant reply. He said, looking back at my career in GE, one of the things I wish I could do over is that I wish I could talk to our people more about what our values were and what we really stood for. Ah, as Jesus said in Luke 16, 8, the sons of this age are more astute than the sons of light. Church leaders should take a page from Novak's playbook. Applied to the church, biblical core values should be a steady compass by which church leaders make decisions and make a stand for what is right, what is true, and what is good. It would be sadly misguided to be more concerned about what the church should stretch for rather than what the church should stand for. Of course, both vision and values are important. Nonetheless, values must undergird vision. The mandate must precede the mission. And the way of God must adorn the work of God. Missing here, we miss everywhere else. Sadly, it is easy for the church to drift from her biblical core values. Question, what does core values have to do with grace and glory? Let me connect the dots for you. Grace and glory leads us to appreciate the grace of our redemption and the glory of our destiny. Between the grace of our redemption and the glory of our destiny is a growth journey of discipleship. And what is helpful are the five basic building blocks of kingdom life for our journey in His grace for His glory. So the big five are so integrated and vital that I've adopted them as the core values for Covenant Evangelical Free Church when I was serving as the senior pastor. Our five core values are truth, community, stewardship, balance, and brokenness. You don't need to adopt these same core values for your church. But I hope that at the end of this IDMC conference, you will at least see that these are five basic building blocks vital for kingdom living. In this session, we would like to look at truth centered upon the Word of God. Let's look in our Bibles at a well-known text in Ezra chapter 7, verse 10. For Ezra has set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. Here's an inspiring example of a guy who made a deep commitment to live his life for what really matters. Ezra 7.10, he has set his heart to do three things, to study, to do, and to teach. Ezra purpose in his heart, he determined in his heart. In other words, he directed his heart to these three things, to study the Word of God, to do it, and to pass it on. Let's explore these fantastic commitments one at a time. 
The first commitment Esther made was to study. It was a discerning pursuit. What we are to know. The first thing we are to note is this. Here's a guy who really knows his stuff. Esther 7, 6 says, Esther was a teacher well-versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. In other words, Esther was an expert. He is well-versed in the law. He has a distinguished pedigree. His family tree goes back to Aaron, the first high priest of Israel. So here's a highly competent priest who's a professor in the law. Yet, in spite of all his accomplishments and accolades, he commits himself as a student of the Scriptures. This distinguished teacher made himself a diligent student. In Singapore, all learner drivers must have a qualified driving instructor with them in the car and an L-plate to indicate that they are learners. As a leadership mentor, I've often told leaders that we must have a double L-plate. On the front is the first L-plate that indicates we are learners. And at the back is the second L-plate to indicate our responsibility that we are leaders. Learners, leaders. So that people following us from behind will see our L-plate as a leader. But out in front, they see an L-plate, another L-plate that we are a lifelong learner. Get this, Esther was an expert in the law, and yet he made himself a lifelong student of the Word of God. So what did he study? The Word of God. In my spiritual pilgrimage, I've learned that the most important world we live in is the unseen world. And the most precious commodity in the unseen world is truth. And this ultimate truth is found in the eternal Word of God. What are the distinguishing features of the Word of God? Psalms 119 is an entire psalm about the Word of God. And in verse 160, I found an insightful statement that reveals five defining features of God's Word. Psalm 9 verse 160 says, All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. Here are the five things we need to know about the Word of God, the Holy Bible. First, it is real. All your words are true. Truth is that which conforms to reality. It confirms reality. It gives us a sense of ultimate reality. In a world of fake goods, fake relationship, and fake news, the Word of God is not fake. It is real. It is trustworthy and true in its portrayal and presentation of ultimate reality. Second, it is not just real. It is completely real in its entirety. All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. All. It is a small but powerful word. It speaks of uncompromising totality. There is no weak link in God's word. All of it is true. The New King James Version emphasizes this. The entirety of your word is truth. Third, it is for our good. All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. Righteous. A corrupt law without righteousness is devastating to our well-being. But God's law is completely righteous. Righteousness is the chief distinctive of the kingdom of God. It is for our good. That's why the psalmist could say, Thy law is my delight. Fourth, it is authoritative. All your righteous laws are eternal. Laws, not suggestions or opinions. The law or ordinance denotes an authoritative voice, an authoritative command. God's word carries absolute authority. A righteous law without authority is absolutely worthless. God's law is lawfully lawful and he stands back by his own cosmic and absolute authority. Lastly, the Word of God is indestructible. 
All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. God's word is eternal. It cannot be deconstructed, cannot be destroyed. For what can be destroyed is not eternal. The psalmist is saying, in effect, all you say is absolutely reliable and can be fully trusted forever. Five defining features of God's word. The word of God is real. It is not just real, it's completely real in its entirety. It is for our good, it is authoritative, and it is indestructible. In discipleship, it is fundamental that we grasp the primacy and authority of the Word of God. Why? Get this, because the Bible is the source code of the spiritual life. For in the Bible is the defined metal narrative of provenance, purpose, and power. Provenance is the language of origin and the beginning. Purpose is the language of destiny and the end. And power is the language of life and capacity that moves us from the beginning to the end. You see, the Word of God metal horizons everything else. In other words, God's Word is divine revelation. It defines all that we see in our existential horizon and determines all that we are unable to see beyond our horizons. Then in both the seen and the unseen, the Word of God stands authoritative in declaring ultimate truth and defining ultimate reality. Thus, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Jesus says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. We must encounter afresh the primacy of the Word of God. Consider now the uniqueness of the Bible. Did you know that the Bible differs from all other theological or philosophical books? It is the only sacred, sacred writing to be rooted in space-time realities in both the history and the geography of everyday life. Nelson Gluet was the Jewish archaeologist whose pioneering work in biblical archaeology resulted in the discovery of about 1,500 ancient sites. In his book, Rivers in the Desert, this renowned archaeologist wrote, no archaeological discovery has ever been made that contradicts or controverts historical statements of Scripture. Quite the contrary, archaeology has facilitated confidence in the historicity of the Bible over and over again. You see, the Bible consists 66 books written in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic written by about 40 diverse authors over a span of 1,500 to 1,600 years, and yet there's an amazing unity in the Bible. Now, some say that the Bible is but a fairy tale for the ignorant. Really? What an unsubstantiated sweeping statement. The Bible has been keenly endorsed by distinguished, credible, and intelligent people. When I preached about the Bible to my church, I gave a sample list of good, intelligent men, among many who have been touched by the power of the Bible. Abraham Lincoln said, I am profitably engaged in reading the Bible. Take all of this book that you can by reason, the balance by faith, and you will live and die a better man. George Washington said, It is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. Sir Isaac Newton, he said, I have a fundamental belief in the Bible as the Word of God, written by men who were inspired. I study the Bible daily. D.L. Moody said, The Bible was not given for our information, but for our transformation. Mahatma Gandhi, he said, you Christians look after a document 
containing enough dynamite to blow all civilization to pieces, turn the world upside down, and bring peace to a better torn planet. But you treat it as though it is nothing more than a piece of literature. What an indictment. John Wesley said, this book has to be written by one of three people, good men, bad men, or God. It couldn't have been written by good men because they say it was inspired by the revelation of God. Good men don't lie and deceive. On the other hand, it couldn't have been written by bad men because bad men couldn't have written something that would condemn themselves. It leaves only one conclusion. It was written by divine revelation of God. No wonder John Wesley's prayer was, let me be a man of one book. May this be our prayer too. Now if the word of God is so important, why is it so neglected? There are three common excuses. Excuse number one, I'm too busy. I don't have time. Actually, it's not busyness. It has to do with the heart. Because if the heart is distracted, even if you are on vacation and you have the time, you will not have the time for the Holy Scriptures. The second excuse, too lazy. It takes too much effort. It's too difficult. And the heart of it, laziness. The third excuse, too hazy, I don't understand the word of God. Too busy, too lazy, too hazy. And so we give the excuse, I don't understand the Bible, it takes too much effort, I'm too busy, I can't get into the word. Excuses. It really has to do with whether our heart is after God or not. Because the opposite is true. Because I'm busy because life is demanding, because things are difficult, I have to get into the Word of God to have my spiritual compass for my spiritual journey in life to tell me what ultimately matters in life. That's what Ezra committed himself to. The second commitment is to do a deliberate obedience, how we are to grow. The disconnect between knowing and doing is a common and serious problem. A church is plagued with a discipleship of acknowledgement without application. Acknowledgement and actual application are two different matters entirely. Truth must be applied. Truth matters, but the application of truth matters even more. In a Harvard Business Review article titled, Make Your Values Mean Something, Patrick Lencioni gave a sobering warning. He said, Take a look at this list of corporate values, communication, respect, integrity, excellence. They sound pretty good, don't they? Strong, concise, meaningful. Maybe they even resemble your own company's values. The one you spend so much time writing, debating, and revising. If so, you should be nervous. These are the corporate values of Enron, as stated in the company's 2000 annual report. And as events have shown, they are not meaningful, they are meaningless. Enron, although an extreme case, is hardly the only company with a hollow set of values. You see, the meteoratic rise and spectacular collapse of Enron has a share of forensic analysis in the business world. Although Enron was the darling of Wall Street, held more than $60 billion in asset, it collapsed, not due to competition from without, but from an implosion from within. At the heart of it, was an implosion of core values. Oh, the company had core values, which the executives ignored, resulting in one of the biggest bankruptcy filings in the history of the United States. It wasn't that they failed to have good core values. Rather, it was because they failed to act upon the values. 
in the same way, it's not just about having the Word of God. It's about applying the Word of God. Ezra determined in his heart to do God's Word. Some have misguidedly highlighted the importance of being by dismissing the importance of doing. They say we are human beings, not human doings. I understand the intent of such a saying. It highlights the importance of being over the supposed mindless activism of doing. However, this does not mean that doing is unimportant. For our being is contingent to our doing. Who we are is shaped not by what we say, but by what we do. While highlighting the neglect of being, we should not marginalize the importance of doing. Both being and doing are equally important. In the Great Commission, Jesus himself emphasized doing. He said, teaching them to observe, in other words, to obey, to do all the things I've commanded you. Matthew 28, 20. Teach them to do. Jesus did not say, teach them to reflect all that I've commanded you. Jesus did not say, teach them to discuss all that I've commanded you. Jesus did not say, teach them to lecture all that I've commanded you. Nor did Jesus say, teach them to write about all that I've commanded you. No. Jesus said, teach them to do. The rest, reflecting, discussing, talking and writing, are not wrong in themselves, but the emphasis on G of Jesus is on teaching the disciples to do. Get this. Doing has to be taught. Teach them to do. It is not automatic. In Joshua 1.8, Joshua was given a counsel. And he wrote in Joshua 1.8, what this council was that defines his leadership. This book of the law shall not depart of your mouth. In other words, it shall not live your life, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may be careful to observe. In other words, to do all things I have commanded you. To do all things I have commanded you. To observe all that is written therein, for then you shall make thy way prosperous, then you shall have good success. Be careful to do. The Hebrew word is shama. And the word is to guard, to keep, to pay attention to. In other words, to pay close attention. To carefully observe, to guard, to be alert in order to do. We must pay careful attention to apply the word of God in our lives. Here's the principle. Doing the Word of God is not automatic. It takes effort. It takes careful attention. It takes us guarding in our life because if we don't guard it, if we don't guard to check that we are doing the Word of God, it's so easy to talk about the Word and not do it. The power of God's Word is when we learn by faith to obey it. Finally, the third commitment to teach a determined transference. Here's what we need. Some of you might think, wait a minute, I, I'm not a priest. Why then would Ezra's three commitment be relevant to me? I give you three good reasons. Number one, because in the New Testament, it tells us we are all priesthood of believers. Second, because the three commitments to study God's word, to do God's word, and to pass it on are vital principles for spiritual growth for every Christian. And the third, because the critical need to pass it on is especially important for the next generation. Now, why teach the next generation? Why pass it on to them? Because if we don't, we win the battle today, but we lose the entire war tomorrow. How then do we pass on the truth to the next generation? We need to learn four critical skills. One, to capture their attention. Not by being like them, but by being like Christ. It is not to dress and talk like young people, but rather to disciple the remnant unto Jesus. To disciple youths, to reach youths. 
The second, to fire their imagination. In other words, to teach them the Word of God, not merely as an academic exercise. It's not just about Bible lessons. Rather, it's something deeper. We need a major paradigm shift here from focusing not only on the Word of God as a textbook, but more importantly, in focusing on the God of the Word. Not just the Word of God, but the God of the Word. The third, to redirect the enthusiasm. It's about life in the kingdom of God. It is about not running after empty pursuits. It is about a grand adventure of faith. When I returned to the Lord from my own backsliding, four years of backsliding, I came back to the Lord 17 years old. Oh, it was a grand adventure of faith. My, my cry in my heart was, make my life count. And my enthusiasm was redirected, was reignited by the Word of God. That is why the fourth thing we must do is to deepen their foundation in the Word. There is no other foundation but the Word of God, the written Word, the Bible, and the living Word, Jesus Christ. Building our spiritual legacy involves living as God's kingdom people and passing on to the next generation God's word and our testimony. Therefore, it is worthy of our best efforts to leave behind a generation that loves God and His word wholeheartedly and exclusively. Let me close with the testimony of Moses and his concern for the next generation. For what is your concern? My concern is for the next generation. Now imagine this. If you were 120 years old and you have a chance to address the next generation, what will you say to them? At 120 years old, Moses knew it was the end of the road for him. And the book of Deuteronomy represents his final three sermons in the last month of his life. They were his swan song. Moses had accepted from God that he would not enter the promised land and he was ready to hand it over to Joshua. But Moses knew that the next generation must be mindful of their covenantal stories. And they must be rooted in the fundamental principles governing their covenantal life in God. Hence, Moses preached his three sermons to that end for the benefit of the next generation. Now, wouldn't it be fantastic if you and I could just listen in to Moses' final sermons for the next generation? In a way, we can, for they are all recorded for us in the book of Deuteronomy. In the book of Deuteronomy, it is profound. It is called Hadivarim, the words in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. The early rabbis recognized it's an important repetition of the law. Hence, it is called Bishne Torah, the second law in Hebrew, translated in the Greek as Deuteros, second, nomos, law, from which we derive the English name Deuteronomy. And the three sermons are found in chapter 1 to 4, chapter 4 to 11, and chapter 11 to 33. Now, at the risk of oversimplification, and yet with the interest for clarity, I offer one way of looking at the three sermons in a broad overview. Sermon 1, living the distinct life, Deuteronomy 1 to 4, as a called people. The first sermon is essentially a brief recital of the history is history with a theological purpose. It charts the distinctive history of a distinctive people with a distinctive calling. And in retelling of the covenantal stories, Moses impressed upon the next generation two things. He highlights the faithfulness of God and he challenged them to live as a cult people. And then he charged them as a cult people to steer clear of idolatry. Now, sermon number two, living a directed life. Deuteronomy chapter 4 to 11. It's living as a chosen people. The second sermon pivots around the terms of their covenantal relationship with God. Two things were highlighted. The Ten Commandments were given with a reminder 
that they were a chosen people. And the charge was given not to forget God, as in the Golden Calf episode, but rather to love and serve Him who has chosen and not abandoned them. Sermon number three, living a devoted life. Deuteronomy chapter 11 to chapter 33, living as a consecrated people. This last and longest sermon began with a warning against idolatry. The next generation was to live a devoted life as a consecrated people. He finally wraps it all up with his succession plan and a prophetic song. Wow, the sermons of Moses in Har Devarim are the most visionary ever delivered to the next generation. They map out the prophetic terrain of a covenantal relationship with God Almighty so that the next generation and the generations thereafter might walk in it. So what's your concern for the next generation? If you want to build deep discipleship in the life of the church, in your life, in the life of the next generation, then the centrality and the primacy of the Word of God cannot be compromised. Like Moses teach the next generation to live as a court people, as a chosen people, as a consecrated people. And to do so, we must get back to the Bible, the Word of God, the truth of God, the first and most important basic building block for kingdom living. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, unite our hearts to fear your name and direct our thoughts unto your word, your truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this juncture, we will now celebrate and commemorate the Lord's Holy Communion. May I request Minister Mario Robia to open us in a word of prayer? We pray. Ginoong Diyos na sa langit, napasalamat kami ginoo sa iyong pagkamayo sa mata ko sa kanamo, sa iyong paglingkun uh, kanamo sa iyong pagtuo, pagsali kanimo mong Diyos. Ginoo, panalangin ang among ginabuhat karong ng Diyos, pagpahinundom sa iyong gugmang gibuhat sa pagtubos sa among mga sala, sa pag, pagtubos ginoong Diyos sa among mga sala. Salamat o Diyos sa iyong pagkamayo sa paghinlo sa among mga sa ginoo sa mata ko sa karon. Labi na ginoon sa matagpanimalay. Prepare ang among kasing-kasing. Una-una ginoon Diyos. Huwag bisang pa sa among pagbuhaton nga karoon kabuntagong. Gino, salamat kayo sa iyong pagkamayo. Sa tanan nga gug ka imong gibuhat ka namo o Diyos. Sa imong paghatag ka namo o sa pagpawala ginoon Diyos sa mga balatian, sa virus, sa among nasod. Salamat o Diyos. O ipepare ginoon Diyos ang tanan. Labi na ginoon sa matagpanimalay karoon. Uh, mag-join sila kanamo prepare po kayo ng kasing-kasing kung nahuna ginoon Diyos sa among pagbuhat na karoon sa pagbuhat uh, ni mo ni Diyos dito sa bukid sa kalbaryo alam sa pagpala ginoon Diyos sa among mga sala salamat ang tanan na mong isaling salamatan ikaw o Diyos in Jesus name Amen. Amen Let us now read from the Word of God the basis of our commemoration and celebration it's found in first corinthians chapter 11 starting with verse 23 down to 29 i will be reading from verse 23 to 26 and then later uh, pastor marvin angeles will be reading from verse 27 to 29 for i receive from the lord what i also pass on to you the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. 
verse 27 to 29, it says, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. In response to God's word for us uh, this morning, I would like to request everyone to come to God in prayer and let us humble ourselves before our God and let us ask for forgiveness for all the sins that we have done. Let us pray. Our merciful and loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We acknowledge that through His death and sacrifice on the cross, our sins are forgiven. And you said in your word that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us from all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, today we come to you with humble heart, with all humility, and we ask, O oh God, for forgiveness for all the sins that we have done in our minds, in our hearts, in our mouth, even in the actions, O oh God, that we have done that is not pleasing to you. Lord, nothing can be hidden from you. You can see everything, O oh God, even the meditation of our hearts and our minds that is not pleasing, O oh God. You see it, O oh God. Lord, today we humble ourselves before you and we ask for forgiveness, O oh God, for all the sins that we have done. Thank you, O oh God, because you said in your word that you are faithful and just to forgive us from our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we thank you today because today we remember that through your love, your sacrifice, you have forgiven us and you have cleansed us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This time, I will request Minister Michael Nerosa to pray for our elements and the elements in your house. Let us pray. Father, Father God, thank you, Lord, for this uh, opportunity that you have given us to uh, participate in your Holy Communion, God. Lord, I pray these uh, holy elements that I'm going to prepare for the church. Sanctify these uh, elements, O oh God, the bread uh, representing your body broken for us and the cup representing yung sa imong dugo na maghinlok diri ka namo oh god ikaw magsanctify ni ini ikaw magbless ni ini oh god even sa mga uh, elements na gi-prepare sa imong mga katawhan sa ilang mga tagsatagsang panimalay oh god i pray na imong i-sanctify Ginoo imong i-bless lord ang uh, bread and cup na ilang gi-prepare Ginoo salamat lord in jesus name amen 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 so be seated Jesus said, This is my body broken for you. Take it in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. In the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. 
Supper has ended. May the Lord bless your lives as well as your families. Let's all stand, please. This time, may I request Minister Jesse Moreno to close our time in prayer. Ama na mo nga sa langit, kami ginoo, nagkapasalamat sa imong pagpahinomdom na mo ginoo. Sa mo ang pagkasaylo ni mo sa mga sala, paghinlo ni mo ginoo sa mga sala. Karoon nga nasa mo mga panimalay, matagusa ka na mo ginoo, ikaw nagkauban ka na mo, ang kintanan ginoo. Ang ibalik ang dungoging maya sa ngalan ni Jesus. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and grant you peace, now and forevermore. Amen and Amen. Thank you, Pastor Norman, for sharing to us the Word of God. It is my prayer that we will live a life of love and obedience to the Lord and grow in our love for others. Hallelujah, church. Why don't we put our hands together as we sing our closing song today. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Let's declare with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Your soul with all your mind, with all your strength. Let's put our hands together. Yes, Father, we will serve you, Jesus. Sing. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. With all my strength, church, let's sing. With all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Hallelujah. We will love you, Lord, with all our heart, soul, mind, with all our strength. Let's declare this church. I will love you. Sing it out. And I will praise you. Lift him up. Yes, we will. And I will serve you. We will serve you, Father God. See you next Sunday.